actually do a lot of makeup for men. So if you guys ever uh, have a headshot and you need some rubbish taken out of your skin, we got you. We all just pull uh, um, corporate headshots too. So a lot of those would like to actually do their makeup on and all show their wives how great it is. So thank you guys for having me today. I just want to say before I get started, I have extreme shortness of breath because I just recently found out that I was pregnant. So I am not in weeks and all the things people don't tell you like, can't breathe when you're pregnant. <laughs> if you know what happens is you your blood flow starts changing. So if I sit down right now and I'm talking with my blood, I can't get my breath. Okay, so uh, I know I only have about 20 minutes to talk and I love talking about myself and the story is very long. So I'll try to clip note it and tell you guys how I got started and how I got to where I'm at today. So it started when I was a little girl. Um, my mom owned a beauty salon. Um, I was a tomboy. She, I'm the only child. She wanted a sweet little princess that she could dress up in girls' clothing and put clothes and curl my hair, and I wanted nothing to do with it. I was a tomboy. I rode four-wheelers, I fished in the ditch, I went crawl down hunting, I crawled in manholes. I would go lost until my mom would call my name at like 9 p.m. screaming for me, where are you, come home? Never had shoes on, wore boys' clothes, nothing girly. Completely opposite of what you see today. But I was always an entrepreneur at heart. I think watching my mom and being around that and seeing how hard that she worked in her beauty supply, I knew I wanted to own her business too, but I had no clue what industry it was going to be in. But I knew I liked garage sales. So when I was a little girl, I would beg my grandmother, please let me clean out your garage. She had a, she was a hoarder. So she always had a bunch of stuff in her garage. She would let me go over and pick out things that I wanted to sell. My mom would take me to Kroger's, which used to be called Apple Street back in the day. And I would go buy a poster board and highlighters and make garage sale signs. I'd wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, go put out signs. And my mom was like, I don't know how this eight-year-old little girl does this, but I would make three to five hundred dollars every time I'd have one, selling a bunch of shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom took me over to First National Bank. Um, she had a business in Alvin. So they had alligators in the bank, and I always loved going to that bank so I could see the alligators when I could go. And so she opened an account for me, and every time that I have a garage sale, I'd save every penny that I made. And so when I was probably around 11, 12, 13, I had about two or three grand saved in a savings wow. account for my little garage sale. So again, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't find my, my knack until I was probably in my mid-20s. So I did what everybody else does when they turn 18, you go to college, try to figure out what you want to do. I felt a lot of stress in high school, not really knowing um, which direction I wanted to go, what college I wanted to go to. I knew my passion for design and art. I've taken a lot of like private art classes when I was younger. Every elective, I would always, you know, gear myself towards, you know, sculpture or architecture, landscaping architecture. And I knew I enjoyed that, but when I went to go meet with the U of H counselor, he scared the shit out of me. He told me that I could be taking 21 hours a semester, eat, sleep, and breathe architecture, and <coughs> kind of backed out. So okay, I'm just gonna go to San Jack to figure out what I wanted to do. <laughs> and meanwhile, I was working at the makeup counter. So I started at Clinique, worked there for three years, um, left to do a commercial uh, cleaning service, which I've heard a couple of you guys um, say you did that. So I was the salesperson that would go get the contracts for you guys. I didn't know what the hell I was selling or what I was doing, but I know that I, if I went to car dealerships, there was always a man that made the decisions, and they needed seven day a week cleans. So it was the most amount of money. So I was doing really well at that. I was making like 100 grand a year as a salesperson, but I absolutely hated what I was doing. I did not, it was an industry, industry that I enjoyed. Um, I wasn't passionate about it. I really, really enjoyed doing makeup. Something kind of evolved in me when I went through puberty and I really, really enjoyed getting dressed up and painting my face and making other women feel really good about themselves too. So along the way, working for the cleaning company, um, I went to a wedding. Met a manager at Miller Marcus, and she said, you know, we pay for the rest of your college if you want to come work for us. I was like, okay, where do I sign it up? So they said they had an opening at the Bobby Brown counter. You guys know who that is? Okay. <laughs> Bobby Brown 15 years ago, everything in her line was brown. I had gone from Clinique and freelance to that. I wasn't interested in that. <coughs> they signed me there, I took the job, I wanted my college paid for. After a couple of days, I was like, I can't do this. This is not a cup of tea. If I want to get back to makeup, I want to do something that I'm passionate about and love. And she said, sorry, I can't transfer. You have to stick it out here at this counter. Um, we don't transfer until you've been here for 90 days. So I stuck it out. And it was the best thing that has ever happened to me in my career, something that I thought was going nowhere. I learned so much from working for that company. I learned how to master the art of natural makeup application and really truly learn how to apply it. At Clinic and Mac, they don't teach you. They just say, here's a bunch of shit, sell it, and make a bunch of money. But at Bobby Brown, she went back to the basics. She's not a pushy salesperson. She's really big on education, and that's why I learned so much about uh, educating women, why we do certain things in certain places in our face, why we don't put on our bronzer, why we don't wear bottom eyeliner, all of these things I learned from working for them. So long story 
story short, I was there for five years, finished my degree in business management, still not really sure what I wanted to do, but along the way I started flipping homes, um, buying houses at auction, um, actually working with my fiance at the time, um, doing all the work myself. She brought tile, I got you, I'm your girl, I know how to do it. And, um, then it got, times got hard around 2008, 2009, where the only way that I would be able to do it would be to do a hard time loan. And it was just really hard to do it and make a profit at that point. So I applied to move up in the position where I was at. I had worked five years with Bobby Brown. I had built my clientele. I was their number one salesperson at the counter. So I thought I was deserving at 27 years old to take over this $2 million a year counter. <laughs> when I applied, I felt like the account executive kind of like blew me off. I didn't really understand why Newmans would have paid for my school. And I worked so hard because I really did give 120% every day that I went to work and why they would pass me up. But they called us all into the office one day and they said, just to let you guys know, we are bringing this other counter manager from Laura Mercier, who wasn't making his numbers, he was failing, over to take over the number one counter <coughs> at the Marcus Gallery at Bobby Brown. And I wanted to cry, I'm not a crier. <laughs> I don't really have much emotions, I have two. But I, it took everything inside me to hold that back. So I'm like, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to grow as a company. I've spent five years here. How could I get passed up for this, right? If it wasn't that day, it was the next day. One of my clients came up to me and said, my husband's a plastic surgeon. We just fired a whole office. I won't, reason to mention, or I won't mention the reasons why. But he goes, we're hiring. Do you want a job? So I applied, got the job, and got out of here as fast as I could. I was so disappointed and felt like I was overlooked for something I truly felt like I deserved. So this day, I really truly felt like I deserved that position. But either I didn't have enough experience, which everybody has to start somewhere, right? They won't even give me the opportunity to move up. And the worst feeling to me in the world is feeling stagnant, feeling stuck, and feeling like you can't move or you can't breathe. And I do not want that for myself. So I went to go work for the plastic surgeon. He fired me five weeks later. <laughs> so as I was leaving Lehman's, before I went to go work for him, they were telling me they would give me that warm RCA counter manager position. And I said, well, I don't want that. You know, I worked so hard to get to where I'm at now so I could grow within Bobby Brown, a brand that I truly believe in. I don't want to go work somewhere else. And so um, I told them that they paid me a crazy amount. I mentioned a really large number. They said no. So when I went to work at plastic surgery, they fired me five, six weeks later. I went and asked for my job back. So at that point, that was one of the hardest things to do for my pride. You know, I just left. I told everybody that I threw this big party for me, this going away party, and I had to put my tail between my legs and go back. I had a boat that I got stuck with from the ex-fiance. I had a house. I had a car note. I was in a situation where I could not, not have a job, and I worked so hard on my credit score to flip these homes, I didn't want to have to go backwards, so I did it. They assigned me the Lord Mercier, failing counters, like down 30%, and we had our first gift with purchase. Does everybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. Little makeup lines have these, spend $100 a year to free go back kind of thing. Well, they sell like $2 million a week, Neiman Marcus does in cosmetics. And Laura Mercier was probably at that point like maybe number 11 or 13 in the rankings of the store. Bobby Brown was, you know, fighting position, the number one position in the store. And that account executive that didn't promote me walked up to me and my team and said, we're going to beat you today. And I don't know why those words don't resonate with me today, but whenever I feel down or like something's really hard or challenging, I think of that. And I went back to my team and I said, Bobby Brown's manager just came over to us and said, they're going to beat us today. They always beat us. Bobby Brown was like twice the size we were. But at that point, I don't know what clicked in my head, and I felt like I had to prove something. And I wanted to show her, you made a mistake. You didn't give me the opportunity, but now is my chance to show what you could have had, right? So we did, and we beat them for the first time ever in New Marcus history, Laura Mercy and Bobby Brown. And we continued to beat them. Every single month, we were growing, and they went from a $2 million counter to a $1 million counter. And this is in 2008, 2009, when, as you guys are, a lot of you guys are in finance, you know, times are really hard, and people who have a lot of money that shop at Neiman's were not shopping, the stock market wasn't doing well, and they were scared to spend their money. And I went from, I think we brought our, our counter up like 30% in one year, and like 20% the second year. So at that point, more more state corporate started to get involved. They're like, what are you doing? Why are the other stores running negative increases and you're running positive increases? And it's not that I ever had a secret recipe to success. I don't have one today. It's all about how much work and effort you put into it. And I care more than everybody else. I wanted to prove a point. I believed in myself. I knew that if I gave everything that I had, I could be successful. And that's what I did. So two and a half years of doing that, for the first time in my life, I really had confidence. I had really built up my own confidence. Like, 
I really can do anything that I set my mind to. Times being that hard, people not opening their wallets like they used to, and I still was running increases. Why am I doing this for an event to making them millions of dollars when I can make myself millions of dollars? So this is where the JKC journey begins. So I wanted to tell you that part of my story too, uh, because you know I know we've all been in that situation where we felt deserving of something and we were passed up on an opportunity. But you can't get yourself down when something like that happens. Anytime that you come to a roadblock, you have to find a way around it, and that's what I did. So in January 2011, I put in my notice at the end of this. I didn't know what I was going to do. I've never not had a job in my entire life besides that guy fired me. After five weeks. Um, but I've always had a job and I always figured things out. Um, but you know what? If I work as hard as I do at Neiman's for myself, this has to be successful. So I started a little wedding website, posted on social media, I started a Facebook page when Facebook pages first started and nobody had one. And I booked three thousand dollars worth of wedding work in one day. It was just by me networking myself, people who would follow me, my clients who had been asking me to do their weddings, but I couldn't because I never got Saturdays off. And so I was like, oh, <laughs> Three thousand dollars in one day. I can make it one day, and I make a whole week standing on my feet working for the department store. So I didn't invest a lot of money. I just invested my time learning about Google Analytics, where my you know people were finding me from, um, doing whatever I can to try to build this wedding business. And what I found was one of my customers that I helped at Neiman's were asking me, um, "Where do I go if I want to buy makeup, or if I want someone to teach me how to put it on? I want you. I just want you to tell me what to go buy." <coughs> so I started doing in-home makeup lessons. Charging them two hundred dollars, telling them you know what Chanel, Bobby Brown, and Marcy products were great for them. And um, long story short, in April, someone said to me, "Why don't you have your own makeup line? When these ladies pay you to go to their house, they're going to shit what yourself. They just want to buy whatever you put poop in a can and they're going to buy it." So you have your own makeup line. So I knew where Bobby Brown started working for her for so long, and then working for Lil Mercy and going to corporate, I learned more about uh, private label manufacturing, contract manufacturing, and how this stuff is really made. It's a big misconception when people think that all these cosmetic companies make their own makeup. They do not. Estee Lauder does not make their own makeup. They do contract manufacturing. So when I learned more about that, I knew Rock Brown started. I called that place. Flew to New York. I had about $2,000 to my name in my savings and bought a last minute plane to get a hotel room and I was pretty much wiped out at that point. But remember I said I had really good credit. <coughs> For some reason, back in 2007, American Express gave me a credit card with a $35,000 limit that I should not have had, <laughs> but I had that golden ticket in my purse. And so I was there for eight, nine hours in the showroom asking a bazillion questions. What can I do to get this started? I have no clue what I'm doing. I went to college to learn how to write a business plan. I wrote about a page and a half of it and said, if I overthink this, if I think like an engineer, I'm never gonna do this. I'm gonna talk myself out of it, so I'm just gonna do it. So I handed them my American Express card and said, I'll be getting some referrals from you guys on what to do next, and my very first transaction for $3,500 on my card. Getting those referrals, not doing any planning, $35,000 later, I started to make a blind, and I didn't know where I was gonna sell it. I knew I had a website, and I knew I had the truck in my car, but that's all I had. So I started doing home parties, like a lot of these multi-level marketing type companies do, um, and I started educating people. I wasn't just selling a product, I was educating them. I was teaching them how to apply. I would grab somebody out of the class, put on their makeup. I didn't even have the full line. I had no eyeshadows, I had no eyeliner, I had no mascara, but I was swinging it. You fake it till you make it, right? And every tube of lipstick that I sold, I reinvested back into the company and bought two more. So my main goal the first year was to grow my inventory because I knew one day that I would come across a store that wanted to sell my stuff and I had to have enough stuff to sell. So I didn't pay myself, I didn't take a dime, actually for three and a half years, I did not pay myself at all. Thank God that I do something where I can charge for my services, so I charged for my wedding makeup and things like that. I would also freelance for Bobby Brown and Laura Mercier at the department stores while I had my own makeup line. I'm slaying at other stuff at Nordstrom's and Neiman's and Saks. Until it got to the point where it was like a bit uncomfortable, people say, oh, is this your, is this Gentry Kelly cosmetics? I'm like, shut up. <laughs> I don't know about that, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Then I had to make a choice, and that was when I took a really big leap of faith at that point, and had to make a decision, I can't do both, because I have to live in a really shitty apartment, drive a shitty car for a little while, that's what I have to do. So I did that for a long time, all my bills had to be under a dollar, I didn't do it, but I learned how to penny pinch, because I had a bigger goal in mind. And I wanted to be the next Laura Mercier, or the next Bobby Brown, and I knew that I could, if for right now I would live very frugally and didn't try to overspend or be a $30,000 millionaire, right? So the very first year that I was in business, I sold $75,000 worth of makeup. Um, 
we were in, by the end of that year, I was in my first retail store. I had a very sweet situation where a doctor who was just starting his practice wanted more traffic in his office, so he gave me free rent. I was there for almost six years. Um, because for every person that walked in the door, they would end up getting Botox or surgery from him. So it was win win free marketing for him and a free place for me to keep my stuff. So keeping my, low, uh, my overhead low, um, <coughs> I didn't rent any warehouse space. I used my house up until last year. So along the way, I started, um, let's say, growing my inventory, growing my retailers. I know she just told you guys a second ago, um, now we're at 15 retail stores in four states. And it's kind of like I opened my eyes one day and I looked down at my makeup bag and I looked in the first floor of my home and it was like Gentry Kelly was exploding everywhere. And I knew it was time to take the next step and make it more professional. So last year, about a year and a half ago, I purchased um, a commercial building, which was a big move for me. I had never really spent much money besides on product uh, for my company. So it was a huge leap of faith, uh, but I found a really awesome investment. And not only did I get a building, with the sale of the building, I got a billboard too a full-size 30 by 10 billboard that came with the building. And it was a piece of shit. I think the building had tried to go for sale three or four times, and it was an eyesore. But thank God that I had that background on you know, construction, so I knew the potential that it had. It really did look like prison. It was pretty sad. It had eight-foot prison bars all the way around it. <laughs> the downstairs smelled like a septic tank. It has a basement. It's one of the only places that usually has a basement. But I knew it had potential, so um, I was able to get a loan, and actually Chase Bank have helped me um, do some of the remodeling as well. So my fiance and I have a team of contractors that we work with, so I was able to do it at a reasonable, pr reasonable price. And I'm super proud to call my new building on 59 on the freeway, on 59 in Shepherd, if you guys pass by looking at things up on the billboard. Um, but it's really helped send uh, a surge of business into my building more for like, you know, advertisement, people seeing, and me being able to tell my story. And that's one thing about me is I'm always really good at like share numbers with people. I don't feel like any of that should be a secret. I like inspiring other people because I came from nothing. I came from a very lower middle class family in the suburbs. Like my mom owned a little beauty shop, my dad worked at the chemical plants. No one helped me with anything. Except for American Express, they gave me their But really, truly, anybody can do anything. My fiance is also a success story, and I feel like he gave me a boost of confidence. We've been together for 10 years now because he owns several different types of businesses, and he's always been behind me. And I think we all need someone like that too in our lives, not someone who's dragging us down, but someone who's constantly pushing you to be the better version of you. But I was like, I'm smarter than him, so if he can do it, then I can do it. <laughs> he was always telling me, he never gave me a penny, and I think a lot of people assume, but it doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks, but a lot of people assume for a long time that he gave me something, or that my parents gave me something. I was like, my parents ain't got shit. I did this with American Express. <laughs> uh, and just really not taking from yourself in the beginning, and if you really want to take your business to the next level, you have to keep investing back into it, you know? Uh, I think a lot of the mistakes a lot of people make is they take personal money out of their business account or they use their personal account for things they shouldn't and then all of a sudden the money's gone or you have two or three slow months. I know we've all been there and if you don't have that good nest egg to fall back on, you can lose everything that you work so hard for. So I think um, along the way, oh by the way, I have to this a second um, We just closed out 2018 with $1.8 million But um, I think we're somewhere around seven to eight million dollars since we started the company. So it's growing fast from seventy five thousand dollars on year one, two hundred twenty on year two, then it jumped to four hundred and then six hundred, and then now it's growing exponentially. And I couldn't be more proud of where it is now, but for all the effort and work that I put into it, I feel like we should be doing like ten million dollars a year. Um, but you know, you somehow you just make it through the day to day and just keep going with your main goal. Um, kind of like just keep your blinders on and just look to where you want to be because there's always going to be the roadblocks that you come up to, but what sets you apart from everybody else in your industry is when you come up to a roadblock, you don't just stop and give up, because 90% of the people out there are going to give up. But if you find a way around that roadblock, even when it's frustrating, it's okay to cry, it's okay to be upset, ask people, ask your friends, ask people in the industry for their experience and their help and their knowledge to get around that roadblock. Do research, read. People don't read anymore. As we all know, nobody reads anything. They want everything given to them. But whenever I come to a point where I can't figure something out, instead of getting frustrated and give up, I find a way around it. And that's what sets me apart from every other person who's trying to start to make a cup line out there with all my ex-employees that work for me that learn what I do. And every time that I get upset when something like that, something like that happens, my fiance goes, don't worry, they're not you. They're not going to work as hard as you. They're not going to do what you're doing because they're going to give up too easy. So 
my point is don't give up keep going find a way around it and you will succeed if you are the one that finds a way around it and finds a solution to problem or a solution to almost any problem out there you will stand out and be the number one so now that i've told you guys my whole story and i didn't pass out <laughs> One of the things that you wanted me to mention were some of the hardships, things that I've come across, uh, hiccups from the company. I really do feel really fortunate. There hasn't been a lot of like failures that I've come across. I know I failed as a business owner and a manager um, many times during my career. There's things that I, I'm not regretful really for anything that I've done with my company. There's things that I've done as a manager or a leader I wish I would have done differently. Um, the hardest thing in what I do is managing employees slash contractors. Um, it's really, really hard to get people on board with your same vision and to treat your company like it's their own when you're not around. And I still feel like it's something I struggle with today. Uh, I don't want to be a micromanager. Uh, I don't want to be looking over their shoulder. But I feel like if you don't let that go, you're not going to be able to prosper and grow your company if you don't learn how to put trust in other people and understand when they make mistakes because they're going to mess up. Even if you tell them all the mistakes that you made, they all make the same mistakes you did because they ain't gonna listen. Because nobody reads and nobody listens, okay? <laughs> but uh, knowing in advance that, that those things are gonna happen, that people are gonna mess up, I messed up, they're gonna mess up, it's okay. People make mistakes, nobody's perfect. But you gotta hold back the reins and you gotta let them take over it and let them take the fight. And like I said, no one is gonna work the same as you, but if you find really, really good people, you compensate them well and keep them on your team and treat them well. Um, another hardship, um, something that I feel like I still tr struggle with, um, another really, really hard thing is social media um, for many, many reasons. I think social media has blessed me because I feel like without Facebook, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. If I didn't have that platform to announce what I was doing and get people to support me, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, um, especially for so long it was free. Now business pages are no longer free. But I had free marketing and advertising, and I would say Facebook up until a certain point was about 90% or more of my business. Um, now it's more Instagram than it is Facebook. Um, but dealing with the haters and the trolls and the, the meanies, the bullies, that's really, really hard because I do take it personal. Um, I know how much time and energy I invest in making this as perfect as I can. Um, and then for have, have somebody like be a hater on YouTube and say, your lighting sucks, why does anyone watch this video? It hurts your feelings. And it's hard. And there's a lot of times where I make really shitty comments back because I'm, you write on my cage, I'm going to F you up. Last of all, social media, when they're a jerk, she knows she's on my social media. It's just a part of my personality. It's really hard to keep that caged up. Um, but, you know, I take it personal because I know what I put into it. And it's really hurtful when people say things like that. But you can't let little comments like that hold you down. Last time someone says something to me on YouTube about my lighting stuff, so I'm like, first of all, video is seven years old. Get over yourself. I don't know what the hell I was doing. Second of all, what are you watching? Go away. <laughs> <laughs> but I told her, I was like, comments like this make me not even want to do this. Like, I would get paid for doing videos. I get less paid less than a penny on YouTube view, right? So I don't pay my rent off of that. But why am I doing this to help you guys if you're going to hate on me and not like the way I do it? But I have my fiance over there like, why do you give a shit? You're getting paid one penny on this news. Why do you get paid on this news? Why you got paid on it? So I feel like that's something that's really, really hard for me to overcome. And it's still a struggle, struggle every day. I have gotten better about, you know, putting the blinders on for those sorts of things. But that's also another struggle that I deal with. And then something else you want to be to mention too. Am I forgetting something? Just your yeah, struggles and then just stories of perseverance and success. It's just not that you can share. So you've done a beautiful job. Does anybody else have any more questions? So we shouldn't let those comments bother us, but we can respond, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an advocate. I actually am an advocate. I, don't, I, I feel like the customer's always wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 And when somebody comes in and acts like a complete whack job, I'll call them out on social media, which is so not professional, but you let me help it. <laughs> and I'll tell them to leave my store. And we had one the other day. I don't know who she is. I'm still waiting for the email, she promised. I'm hunting for her, too. I'm just but, like, um, 
Uh, someone comes in harasses my employees, I do, I do have their back and I do stand by them. I, don't, I do not agree with that customer as always, where I think people will really try to take advantage of um, retail stores, work with Bobby Brown at Neiman's and at Nordstrom's. Nordstrom's is the absolute worst. They will take anything back. You use panties that are like eight years old. Uh, if you take it back, they will <laughs> I don't do that. You use my lipstick, I can't resell it, you ain't returning. It's a testers for, ain't my problem, you don't like the color for two weeks later or five years later. Like people at Neiman's would ship back their entire makeup drawer and say, can I get a refund on all of this stuff? I don't use it anymore. Like, seriously? And those vendors, like me, have to eat it. That's why I don't sell at department stores, by the way. So I want to sell boutiques because I don't but um, anyway, do I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> do you, are you allowed to speak back to people? Yes. 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 I, I just have to say how inspiring your talk was and, and how real and bold you were. And I kind of feel sorry for the man that didn't come today because you were going to talk about foundation and blush and you're talking about <laughs> nothing to do with makeup and you get right down to it. It was just a really great job. Thank you. Yeah, that's how I try to pride myself on being real with people. I hate when companies are on rainbows and butterflies, it is not like that. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely not like that. Um, but I'm always, if you follow me on Facebook, I feel like I'm more myself on there than like on Instagram with pictures, where Facebook is more people complaining, and I'm really good at that. And so, <laughs> because I want people to be more aware, more conscious of how they treat other people, especially in the restaurant business, um, or in retail in general, or any kind of service industry. I think people take advantage of people like that. It's really, really hard to stay motivated and not lose interest in what you're doing. Because even just one person like that a day can really, really get you down and put you in a bad place mentally where you're like, why am I even doing this for people? Like, I'm here because I want to make people feel good about themselves. And if I feel like I can achieve that, because I'm not making everybody happy, it's really, really hard to continue what you're doing. It's nothing that I struggle with all the time. So I try to be real as possible. And like I said, doing it not only make people aware, but just let other people know like you're not the only one. So if you had a real shitty day, I had three motherfuckers call me and bitch me out because someone smoked it on the doorstep today. And they don't even replace it. So there's that. I get called a B-word all the time. Anybody else? I, it's more of a comment. I mean, it, obviously, your story is very inspiring. And I have a 23-year-old daughter who has watched your videos. And oh. she, she is... Tell her thank you for the money. <laughs> but chose to compliment on your makeup, say to you as I leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> he said my makeup looking kind of cool, flawless, one of those words. I was like, thanks, I spent an extra two minutes on it. What do you say to me on the way out today? I don't know, whatever you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. Yeah. Okay. So I've been looking forward to today for like, four months now. <laughs> and it did take me an extra 10 minutes to do my makeup because I was like, okay, I saw you yeah. um, Coming into this industry, specifically what I do, competition is real. Um, I base everything I do off of relationships and building those relationships. And coming from where I came from, from a lower income family who I didn't look, I wasn't taught what credit was. I was taught that it was in my, in, inbred in me that you would have bad credit. <laughs> so, Whenever I found you and saw some of your Facebook pages and watched your videos and realized that I can still be exactly who I am, I can still use the same language and do the uncolorful jokes sometimes and everything, but that's what makes people love you. 
that you are real. And that's why I adore the hell out of you. So it's one of those, whenever I get down on myself that I feel like I'm being someone that I'm not, or going in that direction, I swear to God, your video pops up, and I'm like, oh, there she is, okay. <laughs> so, I want to thank you for that, so thank you. And that's one thing that's it's also very hard, because not everyone's going to love you. You've offended a couple of people, and you're on a sense of naughty words. But that's who I am, and you don't have, not everyone has to love you, and that's okay. You're going to come across people, haters and trolls, or just people who just your personality doesn't blend well with, and that's okay. Because those people just aren't for you, they're for somebody else. Absolutely. And I don't have to have every single person in the United States of America wear makeup. I mean, I would like to. <laughs> but I realize that not every person is, is going to be a good fit for me, and that's okay. And you can't get down on yourself if you found out somebody said something or doesn't like your brand. I mean, it's it's hurtful when someone says, well, her concealer sucks, you know? I'm just like, hey, not. <laughs> but it's okay. I don't like every brand out there that I try either. But um, keep your comments to yourself. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What are your two emotions? Oh. <laughs> My two emotions are I really do um, I really do have feelings, and I think a, a lot of times, like the girls in the office, like I had a miscarriage about a year ago, and um, I think they think that I just literally have no emotions whatsoever. And after doing IVF for a year, and then to find out that your baby doesn't have a heartbeat, it's a really, really tough thing to have to go through. And um, one of my girls said, I was getting on to them about um, being to work on time. I'm really, really big on commitment. If you say you're going to be there, I'm going to show what's going on in personal life. I'm going to be there to make sure it happen. I always make sure it happen. I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up That's the kind of personality that I have. And so um, I was getting on to one of them for not being able to make it to a made appointment. And she said, it's going to be hard for her to have child care for both day and night. She's got three kids. And she goes, but well, you wouldn't understand because you don't have children. That was really hurtful. And I cried in front of them for the first time. And they were like, holy shit, she really does have an emotion. <laughs> that was one. <laughs> and then the other one is, um, I guess, kind of the whole, goes back to the whole social media thing when people, you know, are down on you or they try to bring you down and you know how hard you work for something that sparks something in me, um, rattles my cage when people do stuff like that. Um, so those are, those are emotions that are kind of hard for me to set aside or they don't exist. I don't know how like celebrities do it. And they really put themselves out there and people just like parade them and bash them and I read some of the comments on Instagram. I'm like, jeez, I couldn't keep going. I couldn't to get that big, I couldn't do it. Because I couldn't put myself out there like that. It's too too difficult. Yes. Did the account manager that passed you over ever oh, say that was a good question. I'm so glad that you asked that because I missed that part of the story. So um, actually one of my customers today I've been um, She's one of the ones that was texting me to make an appointment the other day. Um, she, I've been doing her makeup for like probably three or four years at that point. Her father was getting married and uh, the wife didn't know who I was, so she hired somebody else. The person she hired was that accounting executive that didn't promote me. So I was working at Laura Mercier, and one of the parts of the story that I uh, missed about how we had made that, we had beat her for that makeup sale, right? <coughs> Is every customer that saw me at the Laura Mercier counter that came in was like, why are you? Over here, I thought she looked about. I said, "No, girl, I'm over here. You want to come meet your makeup man?" And then I would sell them all Laura Mercier. So that's why Bobby was losing so much business because all the customers were transferring over to Laura Mercier. Um, so she was getting her makeup done at Laura Mercier, and she goes, "You'll never believe who did my makeup this weekend for my dad's wedding." She goes, "Ginger," and I was like, "Oh, really? How did that go?" And she goes, "Well, I asked her what happened. Why didn't Why did she promote you?" And she said to me, "She goes, you know what?" I have to admit that was the biggest mistake of my career was not. And she's been in business for a long time, so to hear that, that was kind of like the point where I'm like, I'm done. My, my mission here is accomplished, I'm done, I'm going on. And it was really at that point that I started saying, you know what, I can do this on my own, I'm not going to work here anymore. Um, but you know, that, that one moment of her looking at me, and I think she was probably just joking when she said, we're going to beat you today, but it just struck something inside of me, and I'm very competitive like that. I'm like, no, bitch, you better stand back. <laughs> Transfer to Laura Mercier. They transferred. 
Who did? The customers? Oh, yeah, yeah. now I did. Yeah. <laughs> you, that's right. <laughs> And it was because of me, because really, at the end of the day, a lot of this makeup is made in the same place. It's all about how you market it. It's the same thing with like, the soles of your shoes. I don't know if you know this, but if you go look at all you'll see the shell and soles. They all say the same thing on it. Um, a lot of the shoes are made at the same place. Your clothing is made at the same place, especially if you go to like Dallas Market, you have boutique, all that stuff is made at the same place. But just have up and market yourself. And in the beginning, I would get people to ask, uh, can you make this stuff up and five gallon buckets in your garage? I'm like, you make sure you can go but um, when I really got out there, I put myself out there, and like she said, I try to be relatable, I try to be me. Um, I don't want to put on this facade that I'm something that I'm not. You like me, you don't, you don't, you don't, that's not me. Um, but I had a large part, and literally with foundations, I had foundations, concealers, powders, bronzers, and blushes, lipsticks. And I know you guys don't know what all of this stuff means, but it's about half of what a girl puts on her face. And um, I had 200 people show up to my lunch party, and we sold $10,000 worth of makeup in two days. So I sold pretty much all my inventory. So like begging people like, I have these textures you want to try because you can't have it. You gotta wait about three months. Got to money now. And that's how I was able to build my inventory. People believed in me and they wanted to support me. She also has a book. I mean, I'm just saying. Oh I didn't mention my book. <laughs> so yes, I wrote a book. It's called Poker to Looker. Um, the men that come in the store really like my book. They pick it up and they're like, what's this? I'm like, I was not a hooker. Um, <laughs> it's a story of, of how, basically what I shared with you guys. Um, and it's a makeup guide for application, showing women how to put on makeup in a natural way. Um, but I teach women, my main philosophy is teach women how to look less like a hooker and more like a looker. In a time where the trend is a lot of makeup, thick, heavy, caked on, 10 foot long eyelashes. This is a lot because I'm you know, speaking in front of people, but I usually wear half of what I have on. But I like women to look their best naturally, and I don't think that makeup should cover up who you are. I feel like it should enhance who you are. So I'm really all about women wearing half of what they're wearing and teaching them how to look like they're not wearing a lot. Correctly color matching and why. I wasn't taught how to do that. I jacked a lot of people up my first seven years doing makeup. I sucked really bad. My best friend's wedding picture, I can't even look at her. I lashes threw up, glued on so much, she has white face. It's hard to look at. But I try to just like fast forward and speed up everything what you guys weren't taught um, from mom or mom taught you wrong. And try to make everything look really, really natural and flawless to just look like yourself, just enhanced. That's our main goal. And by the way, I brought you guys makeup, free makeup lesson cards. Cool. You guys to go to my flagship store and get your makeup done. And for you guys out there, hey, listen, we do skincare stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> we do Botox, we do facials. And actually, there's a lot of men out there that are wearing tinted primers too. So if you got some redness, maybe some rosacea, or you want to protect your skin. Men were actually the first ones to wear makeup. Um, and that's women stole it. I'll do everything else for you guys. I can always do it. Yeah, we do a lot of men's makeup for like photos and headshots, like I was saying earlier. So, if you don't want to get your makeup done, boys, you can give this to your lady friends, moms, sisters, whatever. So I'm going to leave these up here so you guys can.